speaker is someone who lives comfortably way out ahead of our time and who has devoted her professional life to helping people move forward. Elizabeth Merritt is the founding director of the Center for the Future of Museums. The Center is a branch of the American Alliance of Museums, and it was created in 2008 to help museums understand the cultural, political, economic, environmental, and technological trends shaping the world, and to envision how museums can help their communities thrive in coming decades. Orchestras have a lot to learn from the experience of the museum world. Please welcome Elizabeth Merritt. And Jesse, you said at the beginning of your talk that you weren't quite sure what it was that futurists did, so you'll be glad to know I'm going to give you a very short answer to that question. I'm also going to thank you for setting up my introduction so beautifully, because the Center for the Future of Museums really is the result of an edge effect. Instead of the collision of a savanna and a forest in this case, we're the result of a collision of two fields, the fields of future studies and the field of museum studies. And I hope that the fertile result of that collision is something that will help you as I share a bit of what we do. So what is it that we do? Futurists, first of all, to clear up the most common misconception, do not predict the future. So don't come up to me at the reception afterwards and ask me about the stock market I can't answer. What we do is we help people imagine different potential futures within what futurists call the cone of plausibility. There are many plausible, possible futures. And the most important thing for our work is to realize that any of these potential futures could come to pass. We know the forces shaping our world today. We know the trends. We know the events. We need to be aware of the choices we can make. And as we move through the course of the future, we find ourselves heading towards many potential targets we tend to become too fixated on what we think will happen, and then we become myopic, and we can get blindsided when events don't go as we think they will go. We need to use our imaginations to open up our thinking and both realize the kind of utopia that we could live in if we help nurture the right circumstances, but also be aware that things can go terribly wrong and try and know what it is that could shape that dark future that we don't want to live in. One of the truisms of future studies is it's not all about happy robots and technology. It's about trying to find the hints of those potential futures in our world today. A famous futurist once said, any possible future has a toehold in the present. The future is actually already here. It's just unequally distributed. I'm hoping that what I can share with you today are some little glimpses of the future, because I think in some ways, Museums are riding the bow wave. Maybe they're a little bit ahead of orchestras in some ways in trying to navigate these shoals. So what is it that we're finding as we navigate these museum futures? We are finding that we are in an identity crisis. Jesse spoke of the need to understand your core purpose. And this is something that many commercial companies have founded on. So for example, Kodak. It was classically founded on a technology, the technology of film, the technology of cameras. But they became so tied up in the technology, they forgot that the real experience that they were delivering, the emotions, could be done in other ways. And now, in fact, they've been overtaken by all sorts of other delivery mechanisms that mean that those Kodak moments can be shared instantly via people's cell phones over social media. Nothing is private anymore, and they're left in the dust because they were so focused on the mechanism that they forgot the heart of what they did, the sharing of memory and emotions. Even more confusing, you have a company like Sony, which when it started, doubtless thought it was about the wonderful, cool technologies of being able to deliver pictures to people in their office, in their living room. Things are a lot more complicated now. They're actually making most of their money from content not from the little gadgets they deliver the content through, but the actual films and music and pictures themselves. Actually, it gets even more complicated because they're making a lot of their money now selling insurance, strangely enough. All right, so maybe nonprofits don't have as big an identity crisis as that. We do, after all, have our missions. We have some focus. But within that, there can be a great deal of confusion. For example, museums. 
people ask me all the time, what is the definition of a museum? I can't tell them. Because I can put 100 museum people in a room, and they can argue about it for three days, and they will not come up with an answer. We know it has something to do with authenticity. We know it has something to do with the real thing. But what does that mean in a world where the Google Art Project can deliver right into your home computer really high quality digital reproductions of masterworks from all over the world, where they can let you step into those museums and take a tour of the Louvre or the Metropolitan through a virtual environment? Is that real? They're real works. They're accurately reproduced. At the other end of the spectrum, we now have technology that you can take into museums, digital scanners, 3D printers, that let people scan, mash up, and reproduce museum objects to create real physical objects that are adaptations or reproductions of museum things. Is that real and authentic? Hence our confusion. As we try and navigate this identity crisis, we're trying to find and hold on to what Jesse called the core purpose. And many of the museums we see foundering today are ones that instead of holding on to that one true thing, tried to take the whole equation of how you make a museum work, this big complex organism, and control every single variable. And it doesn't work. You don't get to say what all of the pieces of the equation are. So they'd pick five variables and then they'd be left with an unbalanced equation and so they'd diddle the attendance numbers because that's the only thing you have left that you can mess with. But of course they turn out to be wrong. Museums are having to let go of all of those habits, of all of those assumptions, to find the one true thing that they're adhering to and then figure out how to let everything else morph as the world changes. So some of the assumptions they're having to let go of are, for example, assumptions about place. There was a major study last year that I recommend to you by the University of Chicago set in stone about the cultural building boom that took place between 1998, sorry, 1994 and 2008. And there was more growth in building in our sector than any other museums, performing arts centers, theaters. The presumption was that if you had a big name architect and a major new cultural center, people would come use it. Much of that assumption turned out to be wrong of the projects that they identified and studied, 80% of them went over budget, some by as much as 200%. And often the attendance projections were dead wrong. If you build it, they will not come unless it serves a community need. That was an assumption that didn't hold up. Time. The day of the old 9 to 5, Tuesday through Sunday museum is dead. That's not when people live their lives. It's not when they have free time. So you have more and more museums experimenting with being open into the evening. Heck, with being open all night. When the Dallas Museum of Art experimented with this, they had people lined up at 2 and 3 in the morning to get into the museum because that was a cool time to be there. You have museums having to let go of assumptions about content. I kid you not, this is the first Internet Cat Video Festival that was held at the Milwaukee Museum of the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis last year invited to nominate their favorite internet cat video. Don't lie, I bet you have one. They got 10,000 nominations. They narrowed it down to a more navigable 79 to 80 videos. They opened up the lawn outside the museum, had a big screen projector, invited people to come watch the finalists, and they had 10,000 people show up on the lawn. The winner, by the way, was Henri Pardedou. I recommend it to your attention. I was voting for the surprise kitty. This is so popular, it's now gone on the road and may be coming soon to a museum near you. Was it serious content? Actually, one of their curators commented, this is material culture. One of the th most important things a museum can do is help people think critically about material culture and about emerging forms of art. So yes, this was a very to the point of their mission. Museums are having to question assumptions about format. It's not necessarily the traditional four walls of the museum and you come and visit the museum. The museum may come to you. This is the Guggenheim BMW lab that's now traveling the world. It's a massive portable pop-up museum that helps cities examine their thoughts about design. It sets up in New York, in Berlin, in cities in China, and it says, come talk to us about urban design. What do you want the city to be look like? What, is the, what are the elements of design that make a city livable? 
we question assumptions about scale. A museum like the Smithsonian can be tremendously proud if they have a million people come in one of their venues, and next year they have a 10% increase. Well, as their director of digital initiatives, Michael Edson, says, the internet now reaches 2.4 billion people. Does that make you feel a little small? So what is the assumption about scale there? Should a truly national museum with international aspirations be thinking about how to scale up 10, 20, 100, 1,000 times? Conversely, are there muse museums that traditionally in their mission statement say, we want to be world class? Should they be thinking smaller? Should they be looking at their local audience and asking how they can best serve their community? And last of all, museums are having to rethink assumptions about structure and authority, because in some ways those are the assumptions that hobble all of these other variables. So the traditional museum where the director was in charge of curators who had all the status and authority, who told the educators what they could go interpret in the exhibits, that's all changing. And you have museums like the Oakland Museum of California restructuring their entire organizational chart to center on the community, to say, what is the community's opinion of what we should be collecting and preserving and interpreting? Because that is the core of our purpose. In the end, when that equation balances successfully, it's because you found a core purpose that is either essential, people cannot live without it, it's addictive, they don't want to live without it, or ideally both. How do we balance that equation? We look at the world around us and see what the trends are for the way people want to consume these essential and addictive experiences. And here are some of the trends that museums are having to navigate as they try and come to a balanced equation. First of all, people want experiences that are shareable. And I don't just mean walking into the museum with a friend and saying, hi. I want to look at this painting with you. They want to go in with their cell phone and take a photograph and share it on Twitter and Facebook. And this has so changed the whole premise of how museums mediate this interaction that most museums you go into nowadays don't have the old no photography signs, except for the Musée d'Orsay, where they actually have a protest movement that declares flash mob Sundays, where people descend on the museum with their cell phones and say, we're all taking pictures. What are you going to do, arrest us? It's France, they do arrest them. <laughs> People want museums to be participatory. And this is not just participatory in the sense of, here's an interactive exhibit, you can flip up the label. People really want to get their hands on, whether it's hands on your data, so, for example, a lot of museums are inviting people to get online and actually be curators. And people are often experts about things that the museums are not expert about. So, for example, historic photograph collections. You might know who's on that photograph. I, as the curator, don't know that it's your grandmother. You can go in and contribute that data. Sometimes it's physically participatory. This is an installation by Erwin Worm at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art called One Minute Sculptures, where the art consists of a series of props, pictures, and instructions inviting people to create a sculpture for one minute. It is highly participatory. Also highly social because people tend to need help from other audience members and then people want to laugh at them and take pictures, which goes back to the social and sharing. People want personalized experiences. So, for example, in this live museum soundtrack project at the Hammer Museum put on by the Machine Project, you can pick up one of the resident musicians who will plug into a set of headphones, follow you around, and create a personalized soundtrack for the museum. <laughs> That's so cool. People also want more control over the length of time of the experience they have, which I call chunked experiences. It's not the old, we're going to go spend two or three hours at the museum. They may only have their lunch hour. And there's a simple solution. You can say, here's something you could do at lunch. But museums are actually finding even more creative ways to chunk their experiences. This is a DVD slot that's built into the outside wall of the um, Moving Image Museum. It is an installation by Aram Bertold. It's called Dead Drop. You go in with a blank DVD, you stick it into the disc, it sucks it in, thinks about it for a few minutes, spits it back out, and it's given you a digital art collection burned onto the disc that you can go home and consume at your leisure. That is chunked art. 
And last of all, people really want experiences that are multi-sensory. It isn't enough just to have it be a visual experience anymore. Most dramatically, museums are finally finding ways to break the barrier of don't touch because we are now able to use technology, haptics, to take digital data and create the illusion of people being able to touch the things that previously were behind the velvet rope. And people want experiences that are distributed. It's not even necessarily going to the museum. It's how can the museum come to you? Whether that is, as in the upper right-hand corner here, the Museum of London taking augmented reality to project their historic photograph collection on real spaces where they were taken. So you can go around London taking a little tour of history by overlaying the photographs on what you're looking at. Or whether it's the National Portrait Gallery of Canada taking its portraits in the form of high quality reproductions out onto the skateways so people can enjoy watching them while they're skating and playing hockey. They had to have very resilient reproductions because hockey pucks hit hard. I saw some of the dents on the early prototypes. You may notice that a lot of the things I mentioned in that short spiel involve technology. One of the dangers of thinking about the future is the shiny robots and the jetpacks. We get fixated on the technology. Here's a secret. It's never really about the technology. The technology just ignites and accelerates cultural change and helps shape people's expectations. So right now, what museums are suffering from isn't necessarily the inability to either afford technology or the knowledge to master it. It's the fact that people have come to expect them, even if they're a low-tech museum, to behave in the really highly engaging, integrated, distributed way that technology has come to lead them to expect. Do museums have to adapt to this expectation? Heck no. There are examples of successful museums that haven't changed in 150 years. This is the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, up in the Northeast Kingdom. It was founded in 1871. Being an Athenaeum, it has a burgeoning library, but it also has a traditional art collection that doesn't have augmented reality, it doesn't have podcast tours, it hardly even has labels. And it's beautiful, and it's beloved by its community. And there are hardly any other museums like that in the country because it wasn't a highly successful model in the 21st century. Certainly not in the 20th century. It's certainly not going to be in the 21st. There is always space to be traditional. There is always space to adhere to what worked in the past. It may just not be a very big space. So if we're looking ahead to see what the majority of museums might look like in the future, Let's remember we're not trying to predict what that's going to be. We're trying to imagine the different possibilities. One possibility I can imagine is a fragmented world in which most museums stick to the traditional model of being inside the four walls, of presenting mostly non-participatory authoritarian exhibits. And that's going to be fine. They're going to have dedicated audiences. But all of those addictive and essential art, history, and science experiences that they aren't providing are going to be provided by somebody else. So in this fragmented future, you can have things like the Google Art Project reaching out to bring art into people's homes. You can have things like specialized history projects, in this case, the LGBT community saying, this is contemporary living history that needs to go around the country and live in people's hometowns instead of just being in one national museum in DC. Let's take it on the road. It's going to have educational models like Khan Academy saying, darn it, there's no arts education in the schools anymore. Who's going to take art into the schools? We'll put it online and we'll find an effective way to teach kids who aren't getting arts education in their schools. It's a fragmented future that still has vibrant art, history, science, all of these experiences. It's just many of them don't live in museums. Conversely, I can see a future of ubiquity in which the majority of museums have chosen to be flexible, adaptive, immersed in their communities, and more of them may end up looking like Project Row Houses in Houston, which is founded on the premise that art is essential to the well-being of a community, and that a community's identity is housed in its historic structures. Is it historic houses? Yes. Is it about art? Yes. 
It also has a laundromat because that community desperately needs a laundromat. It has daycare for working mothers because otherwise they can't get jobs. It has educational vocational programs for the youth that need to go out and find futures in Houston. And it also has resident artists. And it also has preserved those historic row houses that were part of the fundamental identity of that neighborhood. So my challenge to you as you go through the conference for the next couple of days is take those two potential futures out of the many that are out there, fragmentation and ubiquity, and as Jesse said, fill in the word orchestra. In a fragmented future, if orchestras choose to fill a vital but more constricted role, who are the other players that are going to step in and provide those compelling addictive experiences? And in a ubiquitous future, what will an orchestra look like? What are all the ways it might be embedded in the community? How might it look very different from the community, from the museum, from the orchestra that you saw 20 years ago? So in 50 years, if you fast forward, and I say to somebody, what is an orchestra? I might get an answer as different as if I said to a child today, what is a phone? Because this isn't about making phone calls. It's about communication. It's about sharing. That's its core purpose. What is the core purpose of the orchestra, and what would it look like in a ubiquitous future? Thank you. <laughs>